The objective of the organization We the World is to facilitate cooperation on a global scale amongst groups and individuals dedicated to implementing solutions to the many challenges we face on the planet at this time. Welcome to the 11 Days of Global Unity Summit 2023. My name is Jana Larson, and I am coordinator of the Economic Justice Campaign for We the World, as well as filling many other roles for We the World. Today, I'm excited that we'll be joined by Joya Como, who will be teaching, talking about health. For the 11 days summit schedule, you can register for free by going to we.net. Then you can participate in the after panel public discussions and see replays of the recordings. There you can also contribute to support us at We the World by going to we.net. Now let's bring in my co-host, Rick Ulfick. Rick Ulfick is the founder of We the World at we.net and the co-creator of 11 Days of Global Unity. Welcome to the broadcast, Rick Ulfick. That's great. Thank you, Jenna. And thank you all so much for joining us for this discussion of health at our 11 Days of Global Unity Summit. Now it is my pleasure to in introduce Joya Como, who will share her personal experience and insights from her medical journey towards health and wellness. I'm going to bring Joya into the spotlight now. And uh, Pete, please note that the ideas, practices, and experience presented here are definitely not a substitute for the care of doctors, nurses, and other professional medical practitioners. That said, Joya Camo has dedicated her life to learning as much as she can about self-healing and inner peace for herself and in order to re reflect that out into the world to be a catalyst and a magnet to in unite the family of light here on Earth. Welcome to the broadcast, Joy Joya Como. Thanks, Rick. Sure. And Joya, can you please introduce this video that we're about to see that takes us on your personal medical journey and includes excerpts used by permission of a video produced by Healing Strong. And they're located at healingstrong.org. Yes, well, I guess it's been about four years ago now. First of all, I've always been, well, always, it seems like always, for the last 30 years, I've been veg and over 10 vegan. So about four years ago, I, you know, was diagnosed with cancer. And I was like, how in the heck did I get cancer? I don't understand. So I did the normal, you know, surgery and all those things, full hysterectomy. And then they wanted me to do chemo and radiation. And hormone therapy. And I was just like, I can't really do that to my body. You know, I just really don't feel that. So I just uh, felt like I was going to carry on. And about a couple of years after that, it metastasized into my left lymph node. And I said, okay, well now I guess I'll have to do, sir. I guess I'll have to do chemo and radiation. And I even had, you know, the appointments scheduled, 15 appointments, the sandwich with the chemo radiation, putting the port in my arm. I was going to have to go home, get out of my apartment in two weeks, go back and spend six months doing all this. And I was just like, this is a nightmare. I just don't feel this. I don't understand. I need to meditate on this. So uh, really good friends uh, who you all know, uh, and some you don't, um, actually guided me to know, you know, maybe there's some alternatives. So I started looking into it and I chose not to do the medical route. And I'm glad I did because after that, 
I just totally went fruits and vegetables for six, well, five or six months. No oil, no salt, no sugar, nothing, but just constantly giving my body what it needed to heal itself. And it did. When I did my scan, the tumor was gone. So I totally learned that fruits and vegetables could actually heal. And it's not the doctor's fault that they don't know this because it's not taught in medical school. But what you're going to see in this video, a lot of the video comes from processed people, which was a documentary that was made 15 years ago. And uh, many of these doctors are the ones that I researched and found myself. Uh, but literally 15 years ago, nothing has pretty much changed from this video. So it's pretty interesting. So now I just want to help get the word out to people to let them know they have alternatives if they choose to. Yes, I even say in the video, I'm not against anything that's going on. It's just I didn't, I wasn't aware, and I just want to help people get aware of, you know, what's out there. So that's that what this good. is all about. All right. So, uh, and people will he uh, hear you and see you at uh, kind of give, giving the, the scope. So let's watch the video and uh, I'll just have I'll to... just preface the beginning of this video is when I was first diagnosed. Uh-huh. And I was asked these questions that I answered on video. Okay. Oh, that's great. Okay. Stand by. Hi, my name is Joya Como. And I was asked, why am I doing this? Why am I doing what? Well, I have cancer, like many people. Mine's a little bit different in that it is maybe more aggressive, but you know, on a spiritual path all my life, I've done everything I possibly can from being vegan, vegetarian, 20, 30 years now, on a spiritual path, traveling the world, doing emotional cleansing for 10 years, you name it. But guess what? I still got it. So hello. The reason I'm doing this, this video, is I want to share my experience with everyone and see if it's a way that, you know, they can be helped in their lives as well. And of course, I'd like to be cured of cancer. Why not? So my next question, what is your motivation? Well, I think my motivation is to really, you know, get healed, like I mentioned, but also to share that with the world, because there's so many people with cancer these days. It's just amazing, like everybody. And I'm just really not sure if all of these cancer treatments are helping people, meaning they are, but I mean, they come back and everything. So besides just doing that with the cancer, I'd like to get to the motivation of the cancer. Like how can we not have cancer come into our bodies? So I'm aligning myself with a lot of alternative healers and my friends and family who have been fabulous to me and loving and wanting to, you know, really support me in this vision of, hey, can we really find out, you know, and help other people, let them know what alternatives they have and just let them give them a voice, let them share their experience and, you know, be together with other people in this journey. How far will I go in disclosing full disclosure, personal disclosure. Well, I think, you know, my life's an open book already, so I might as well keep it open, wide as open as possible. So yeah, wide open. What do I want out of it? Well, I have to tell you the truth. I would love to do a reality TV show and like on Netflix or something or any kind of video, really document the process so that everybody can really see what's happening in the moment and have a website, have Facebook, have every way for people to be able to get in touch and ask, you know, not me ask questions because I won't really have time to do that all the time. But, you know, just example, I just watched uh, people get married, just face to face, get married for the first time on Netflix. So why not, you know, make it entertaining and educational for people to actually get enrolled in it, not, you know, a lot of the things that happen are just really um, data or things that people, not everybody would see. So, I mean, I would like to make this an interactive way to build community around the world. And, you know, from that, hopefully have uh, success stories, of course, to share and maybe living communities that we've talked about having centers around the world, that would be fun. Um, yeah, that would be a great outcome. And of course, to live to enjoy it, that would be great too. <laughs> How do you currently see, feel it unfolding? You know, the truth is, if I would be honest, 
uh, first of all, I don't want any negativity, nothing against anything, no war against cancer, no war against anybody, you know, happy to be grateful for all the modalities that are out there currently in the modern medicine world and all the great doctors and all the research that's being done. I worked in a pharmaceutical uh, company. I know that people are dedicated and they're doing their best and they're doing it from their heart. I'm not saying anything negative or against modern medicine or chemo and radiology uh, or radiation or immunotherapy. All that's great. I'm just saying in addition to that, would love to give more exposure to other options that if people are interested in, would like to see who else is doing what, and then maybe get those together, meaning the spiritual, more uh, holistic, you know, more alternative together with the modern and see if there's any, you know, gray area in between that we can all get together and make a difference. That's basically the key. The standard American diet really is the underlying problem related to the health crisis that we have in the United States. The diet that we celebrate as normal is actually killing us. We should start eating as if our lives depended on it. In children, we're starting with obesity and diabetes. Midlife, people are diagnosed with high blood pressure. We have patients who are in their 30s and 40s who are being diagnosed with cancer now. Clearly, we're moving less, we're eating more, we're getting much heavier. Plus, the type of foods we're eating has changed dramatically. Um, we're eating foods that are more processed, more refined, and more calorie dense than ever before. A lot of us are still undernourished, despite the fact that we're overfed. I mean, we're eating way more calories than we need, but we're still hungry in a way. Our cells are still craving something because we're not getting the nutrients we need. We're eating so many, so much junk food. When you eat a diet that's so unhealthy, you become a food addict, and, you, and it makes the body crave more calories just to feel well. Really fat because we're sold really bad food. When I was growing up, we would, whenever we would go out for quote-unquote hamburgers, that was a rare event and it was a treat. And I know families now that this is how they feed their kids. It's like, okay, you're hungry, let's go to KFC. Uh, tomorrow, you go to McDonald's. There are billions of dollars spent each and every year influencing children and adults to eat greasy, salty food, food that, that is dense in calories while being completely not dense in nutrients. Now, the Kaiser Foundation did a study recently over a few months on advertising, TV advertising to kids, and they analyzed 8,800 television ads. And out of those, the majority of them were for high fat, high salt, high sugar, high calorie foods for children. Of those 8,800 ads, guess how many were for fresh fruits and vegetables? Zero. It takes between 3,400 and 4,000 calories to fill the stomach one time with chicken, cheese, and oil. It takes 200 calories to fill the stomach with vegetables. So as long as we continue to eat refined and processed foods and lots of animal foods, we're going to continue to have weight problems in this country. As I talk about this concept of toxic hunger, that when you don't meet your micronutrient needs, you feel very poorly when you stop eating for a few hours and your body stops digesting food. And you could feel shaky, weak, lightheaded, mentally confused. Overall, you feel ill and you feel better if you eat food again. You know, we're in the information age and the amount of information available to us is just incredible. Not only can you get access to good information, you also have ready access to bad information. And most people do not know how to filter the information between what is good and what is bad. We've turned over school lunch programs to fast food restaurants and or you know private groups who are the lowest bidder and they just come in with all kinds of junk and garbage. The idea of offering chicken nuggets and pizza in the cafeteria may be appealing to a nine-year-old but it's certainly not the diet that they should be living on. We have a, a Department of Agriculture that subsidizes products like high fructose corn syrup, products like uh, 
oils and fats that aren't good for us, and factors that, that of how food affect the human body and to create addictive drives and cravings. When you add corn syrup, when you add MSG, when you add a higher percentage of sugar, when you remove the fiber, when you remove the volume, when you don't have phytochemicals in your diet, all, a lot of these things play a role and interact. So the answer is very complicated. And then we cut out the uh, PE classes because that was felt to be expendable and too expensive. Uh, and so then the kids don't even have a way to burn it up and as a result, they're gaining weight. I think Americans uh, <clears throat> really haven't been challenged uh, to, to think about what they eat. I don't even think they even think about it. It's a difficult question, especially in a society today where, by the age of 40, autopsy studies show that almost all Americans have developed some form of heart disease. They have atherosclerosis. Health, in, in, in my opinion, would be when you wake up in the morning, you don't have aches and pains, and you just absolutely have all this wonderful energy, and you don't have an illness, and you're not popping pills. I used to see health as the opposite of disease, and I don't do that any longer. I think of health as our natural state. Sickness is an abnormal state. The body's intended to be healthy. It's intended to look good, function well, and feel well. If it doesn't, then that's wrong. You know, even though in our society, wrong seems to be normal because so many people are wrong. You know, they're sick, they're fat. I really do believe that if we were not interfered with, if our bodies were not poisoned with toxic substance, and that's food and the environment, if we lived in a pure environment, we would be healthy. Health is not just the absence of illness. It's it's the presence of well-being. We have a, an explosion of, of high blood pressure, diabetes, heart disease, allergies, autoimmune conditions in this country. And so we can't say that a person that, with the absence of symptoms who feels well is healthy if we see signs that diseases are developing but haven't yet become symptomatic yet, can we? Could that be good health if you feel well and then develop cancer five years from now? Were you really healthy five years when you had before when you had no symptoms? Health, I, if I'm correct, health came from the same root words as holy and uh, and whole. So to me, it's the whole composition of who I am and the way I exist in this world. If in the year 1900 in America, only 2% of all Americans developed heart attacks and strokes, and today it's 51%, are we healthier today? And it looks as if we're living longer than we did in the 1900s because we've because people aren't dying of these diseases of ch at childbirth, they're not having so many infections in the first year of life. So to me, to be healthy isn't just to eat healthy, but it's to have healthy relationships, healthy interactions with the environment, healthy family, healthy everything. And all of those things then come back to help improve my health too. But the question is, in, our, in the last 15 years of life, do we have a healthy life expectancy in this country? How much do people suffer in those last 15 years of life? And the answer to that question is probably more than ever before. That's the, the definition of health, the ability to engage in life fully, have all the energy you need to do all the things you want to do, and to maintain that until you die, to live until you die, instead of engaging in a gradual process of degeneration starting sometime around when you're 40 or 50 until you're just not functioning anymore. Millions of dollars the American Cancer Society most of that money has gone to the drug, in, drug research and drug companies finding us to have a solution. We're looking for, we have a pill solution for everything. It's like we, people think life is a fairy tale. We're going to find a magic wand and say you can be healthy. They don't realize that you have to earn good health. The medical profession right now is doing what? We're feasting on selling disease. And we are so successful on selling sickness that there are not enough dollars in this country to pay for it. I've talked to many cancer doctors, and I said, well, what about diet? Well, yes, of course. What about prevention? Oh, sure. I said, did you learn much about that? No, we didn't. Are you interested? Not really. Because it's not high tech, there's no money involved, and there's nothing involved in telling people, go and eat more fruits and vegetables. The degree to which profit, uh, and profit-seeking, profit motive, has sucked the spirit out of healing and medicine, and, and replaced it with a something that's unworthy of us as human beings. Healthcare in this country is expensive because we let it be and we let business uh, control things. I mean, if we were just talking about a drug-based business, most of the good drugs are generic and they're really cheap. 
best blood pressure pills there are, are diuretics that cost, you know, a penny for, for many pills. Whereas what's sold are the $4 a piece blood pressure pills, which are less effective, which has been proven, less effective and more dangerous. But it's the, it's the profit that drives uh, the kind of care that we have. We have this new religion in modern America today, and that religion I call medicology, the belief that our savior is the doctor or the medical profession or the pharmaceutical companies who think that giving us a pill is our answer to a long, healthy life. My wife says, whatever you do, stay out of the hospital under all circumstances, and she's a doctor. To a degree, I think that the medical, governmental, and pharmaceutical complex has failed us. Our educational system has failed us. It hasn't given people the knowledge they have needed to control their health destiny. We want to believe in magic. A true healthcare system would be one that empowered people and gave them the information they needed to take care of themselves. People don't eat vegetables when they're pregnant. Women don't eat vegetables, so instead we tell them to take a folate pill. Right? They don't eat vegetables, so the baby comes out. We give them a shot of vitamin K into the baby's thigh. To, you know, we've turned everything into a, into a medical solution instead of getting back to the basics of what constitutes a healthy life. If you change the financial incentives in our health care system so that good health, good function, and a good diet were the rewards, then we'd see a change in our health overnight. In America today, our diet is predominantly from processed foods, oils, sweets, and animal products. The amount of fruits, vegetables, beans, nuts, and seeds in the American diet is dismally low. The scientific evidence is fairly clear that humans thrive on a plant-based diet that's relatively low in fat, high in fiber. It has a low calorie density, a high nutrient density, and a high satiety. A wide variety of fresh vegetables, green ones, yellow ones, red ones, orange ones, all kinds of colors, and whole grains. Plant-based, whole food, unrefined, unprocessed diet. What I recommend for all the families in my practice, fresh fruits, vegetables, grains, beans, pasta, a little tofu. One of the nations that don't have many of these chronic illnesses that we in the Western uh, world do have. And uh, uh, the diet that seems to do that the safest and the best is a plant-based diet. Any society that we can look at the world over that had long life and a very healthy life expectancy in the most elderly members always had a diet rich in vegetables. Not only do we see populations that eat this type of diet see, uh, suffering from far less degenerative disease than we suffer from here in the United States, but we see people who are ill reversing their illnesses when they adopt this type of dietary plan. It doesn't include things like high fructose corn syrup. <laughs> It doesn't include things like hot dogs and hamburgers. It doesn't include things like milkshakes. It's interesting, it doesn't include a lot of things that are standard in the American diet. No diet can be considered healthy unless the vast majority of its calories come from these primary nutrient, naturally nutrient-rich plant foods. That's gonna really save us from these chronic illnesses. The classic example of which, is, of course, is cardiovascular disease, heart attack, and stroke. That same approach is going to protect us, I'm really quite sure, from Alzheimer's disease and dementia. Most of those diseases of dementia seem to have a very important vascular component as a, as a, as a precursor. People have lived on rice, like the Asians, or sweet potatoes, like the people from New Guinea, or plain potatoes, like the people in the Andes, Peru and Chile, corn for the Indians. It's been a starch-based diet. How are you going to be obese? when you're eating a plant-based diet. How are you gonna be, uh, have diabetes or hypertension? Just a really elegant, simple diet, plant-based protein, a lot of fiber. And the great thing here is that you really, we can control our health destiny. We don't have to be sick and we don't have to have happen to us these tragedies that befall other Americans. There are other factors besides diet and nutrition that determine good health. And those other factors may be getting sufficient rest and sleep. We have a chronically sleep-deprived society, and that's not good for our general health. That's well established. We need to exercise regularly. We have a population that's not physically fit, and we develop sarcopenia. In other words, that means our muscles shrink as we get older, predisposing us to bone loss, falling down, breaking our hips, having poor musculoskeletal fitness in later years. So anyway, I've, I've been practicing about 30 three years now, and uh, I 
as Chitvan said, I, I practice integrative oncology, which, which means I use, um, I, I take from all healing disciplines, Ayurveda, traditional Chinese, naturopathy, homeopathy, and then MD, allopathy, uh, osteopathy, all of them, because uh, no one has the answer, not one of them has the answer. They all have parts that work. Um, and so I, so an, an integrative approach is where you use, uh, you actually integrate uh, the best and the most effective from all the modalities, and that's that's what we do. And so I I, I met Chitvan I think two years ago, three years ago now. Um, from I was introduced by another uh, physician in the U.S. who does similar type of work as I do, uh, Dr. Sunil Pai. And um, anyway, I um, I was very uh, I was amazed that anyone had addressed the microcirculation because it's always been ignored. And the reason it's been ignored is because there's nothing you can do. There's no drugs. There are some studies that, 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 that they use drugs, and we find out what these drugs do is they actually um, just reduce inflammation. Um, and they're usually patented drugs, and you can actually get a much better result with intravenous curcumin uh, and intravenous vitamin C than you could with these drugs. And plus, there's no side effects. There's just side benefits. But that's all they do. They don't really deal with the microcirculation. It, but even though the endothelium of the microcirculation is what mediates inflammation, so in a way they're indirectly getting there. But again, they don't they don't deal with the uh, actual flow. Um, so this is the only thing in the world that works that does that. And <clears throat> if you uh, if you knew me, you'd know that I have a I I, I abhor technology. I abhor machines. I think they are the beast. I think they are destroying the, the planet. Uh, it's a it's a it's a form of idolatry that the Earth has never known. And um, anyway, but here I am with a Beamer, and I, you know, so it's like, <clears throat> but it's the only machine I use. I can I, I don't like machines. I don't even like the word machine. It bothers me. I'd rather call it a device. Um, but anyway, um, so with my patients, um, they come in in stage four cancer usually. I'm lucky if they're stage three. And they've had chemo, radiation, and surgery, and they usually come crawling in, um, and they've been told they have three weeks, three weeks to live, a month to live. And of course, they're, it's extremely challenging. So we do everything possible, and that now includes Beamer. And, and the way we have worked it into our program is that since it opens the microcirculation, which, you know, so think about it. If we're giving a, if we're giving a therapy intravenously and the microcirculation is shut down, it's going to shunt. It's going to go from the arteries to the veins, and it's going to miss the target. And the target is the tissues, the cells. You know, so um, it wouldn't matter. If I'm putting in the best therapy in the world in that vein. It's not going to get to the target. Then what's the use? So now they do the eight-minute session before uh, therapy. So for, first, what I do is I hydrate them. I give them, um, depending on their cardiac status, etc. I give them anywhere from 500 to 1,000 cc's of a fluid, uh, and then and then I'll do the beamer, and then we finish the therapies, and then we do the beamer again at the end. Some of them go on to purchase them so that they can use it at home for sleep. You know, I mean, and use it during sleep as well, and let their other family members use it. But um, it, so it's really hard for me to say over the last several years what changes I have seen with it because I I've, I've moved from the U.S. to Thailand. Uh, I'm always training staff. I've got a, many different therapies. It's all working, but it's all working better now. It also everyone I've seen to be having uh, probably close to 68, 68 percent. And if you think about 68 percent with stage four cancer, if you look at the data published in the Journal of Oncology in um, 2005, um, the data showed they did they did um, they did they analyzed. Uh, the data from America and the data from Australia, and they looked at the prognosis of, of being alive at five years if you're diagnosed with stage four cancer. And um, in America, you had a 2.1% chance of being alive, and in Australia, you had a 2.3% chance of being alive. What we're looking at here is an individual with chronic stress. Uh, it is a male, and this microscopic area was filmed. You'll also notice, and on the venular side, you'll see very few white blood cells on the, on the edges. You'll look rolling around. So that means the immune system is also not well activated. You're going to see here 
There's also diminished vasomotion. There's no movement you would see on the left side of that arterial. I haven't seen any. There's restricted blood flow. Like I said, the white blood cells aren't circulating, and this equals poor perfusion. Too much of this going on, you're going to feel tired. You're going to feel sluggishness. So I want to take a look at what happens after the beamer was turned on after three minutes of treatment, or for the non-practitioners and clinicians out there, three minutes after application. As this comes to your screen, you'll start to already see the increase in flow, the increase in movement. You can see the capillary open up. There's increased arterial flow. And what you can also see is increased venular flow returning back to the lungs to recycle, to bring out, and to remove those metabolic wastes that the body has created. You'll also see, after six minutes of stimulation here, the increase in the white blood cells. Pay special attention on the, left, on the right side of the white blood cells rolling through the endothelial or over the endothelial walls. That's like cops being out on the street protecting you. That's your mobile immune system. And when your blood's moving, your immune system working. And if your blood is not functionally moving, you can't possibly have a functional immune system. Therefore, you're not protected. Think about it this way. If you're perfused, you're protected. Support yourself, support your immune system through healthy blood flow. And we're going to see also when the beamer was shut off after eight minutes, they followed and did a 30-minute video and looked at the lingering or the ongoing effects of beamer after 30 minutes. So now this person's been off the beamer for 22 minutes. And look at what we're looking at. This effect can last up through 18 hours and maybe more, and for some left, less rather. But the fact is, Beamer is incredible at supporting your blood flow. Earth to God, come in God. I know you're there, hearing our prayers wherever you are. We need you now. To send your love down Take away the pain in your holy name We ask this now We need your light, we need your love To heal the world you made And save us now in our darkest hour With your amazing grace Earth to God We're holding on, but not for long. Can you pull us all close to the Holy Ghost and keep us strong? We need your light, we need your love to heal the world you made. And save us now in our darkest hour with your amazing grace. To God, Earth to God, Earth to God, Earth to God, Earth to God.
Hey, just want to give you an update while I am alive, and it's a couple of years later from when I made that first video in the beginning of this film, and so much has happened, so many alternative things that I've done, but mostly it's the food. 70% I would say it's the food. I went strictly veggies and fruit for five months. No oil, no sugar, no salt. Basically, it wasn't good. It didn't taste good, but after two months, my taste buds started having everything tasting sweet, even water. Anyway, long story short, I had my six months checkup, the scan, and the tumor was gone. So I'm going to tell you that veggies and fruits really work and all kinds of alternative um, modalities. So if you go to the website, which you'll see at the end of this film, and get in touch with me, you also are invited just to learn more about how you can um, heal yourself. It's all about self-healing. So looking forward to seeing you and talk soon. So that was very inspiring. Thank you for being part of the 11 Days of Global Unity Summit. And uh, Jana. Thank you, Rick. And thank you to Joya Como. And thank you all for watching this and for being a part of the 11 Days of Global Unity. Go to we.net to get involved. And don't forget to stick around for the public discussion right after this panel. Thanks, Jana. And was what we do at the end of each of these panels, it's all about we, right? So can we go from a me society to a we society? That's the question. And, and that's why we launched uh, we.net. So we can have a, a we society that works for all. Thank you all so much. Bye-bye.